Hello, I'm Manoj Karmakar. Welcome to ISSPS TV. Through this channel, we hope to bring you quality education in regional anesthesia. If you like any of our videos, then do remember to click the like and share button. If you are new to our channel, do remember to subscribe so that you can get regular notification of any future uploads. Hi everybody. As Manoj already mentioned, I'm a big Rolling Stones fan. And I dedicate this lecture today to Mr. Charlie Watts, who died unfortunately in the age of 80, prior to the starting of Rolling Stones tour in the United States starting uh, September 26. And for myself, it's a privilege to share that this is, believe it or not, my lecture 1000 I give to you, and I hope I can give you some new insights for thoracic and paravertebral anatomy. Remember, that's what I said when we talked about lumbar. Not all of your patients will have perfect spines, and especially if you have uh, severe obesity, it's not that um, easy sometimes to get to your bony landmarks, but better than in the lumbar spine, in the thoracic spine, even with uh, obesity, you can palpate spinous processes and orientate yourself. But keep in mind, and I will show that to you again, uh, one spinous process is not always above the other, and this is important for orientation. One general consideration, if you see a thoracic spine from posterior, I indicate the lamina and the width of lamina, lamina over seeds. That's much more than the width of body. That means in the thoracic spine, contrary to the lumbar spine, you cannot access, ultrasonographically speaking, um, the neuroforamen or the body of a, a thoracic vertebra, except the lowermost, and you will see that. So very different. And if you see the right-hand side of my image, you see there's an additional window, if you so wish, because uh, the, the laminae of the lumbar spine vertebrae is very narrow, and in thoracic, it's very wide. I will do the same as I did with the lumbar. We talk about interspinous, transverse now, that's new, interarticular notch, as I call it, interlaminar space and spinal canal boundaries. If we have a look at the whole thoracic spine, left-hand side part, upper and middle and lower and, and middle on the right-hand side, you see the interspinous spaces. And if you come, for example, between one and two, you will see part of the vertebral canal uh, shining through. The same is true if you go 11, 12, but in the mid thoracic, if you strictly go forward, what you see from posterior is bone. That means you're not going to the um, vertebral canal unless you put your needle from lower to upper and or from lateral to medial. And this is the interspinal space, and you see uh, how steep the spinous processes are directed uh, postural and downward. And the intertransverse space considerably changes from upper thoracic to lower thoracic. So the intertransverse space is completely different in the lowermost part, for example, between 11, 12, 12, 1, or also between T10 and 11. And this is important if you do a transverse images, they are completely different from middle and upper part of the thoracic spine. Uh, if you do a transverse section through the spinous process, as indicated here, you will always see the transverse process of the next lower vertebra, not the same, that is also important. It's not so, for example, if you scan the spinous process of T11, there's no transverse process on the side, so it's completely different anatomy. And in gray, you see the interlaminar space. That is completely different from first down to 12th. So this is important for orientation of your probe if you want to visualize parts of the vertebral canal. As I said, in the lumbar spine, the interarticular notch, what I call it, it's the classic example of a TH6 in the middle, but the upper, it resembles cervical, and the lower, it resembles uh, lumbar spine vertebrae. And this is important to know if you want to access 
or if you have no chance to access the vertebral canal. Keep in mind, even if you come from lateral posterior, you see the interlaminar space, but many, many patients will have ossification of the ligamentum flavum, and then it gets even dif more difficult or sometimes impossible. So you have to know your limits of ultrasound. And this is a pretty normal spine and see what the spinous processes do. They are directed completely different from one to the other. And if you combine those, it gives a, a wavy line instead of a um, vertical line that you could follow. Keep that in mind if you do your ultrasound scans. And something very important is if you see transverse process of 10, there's a tremendous change to 11. 11 has almost a rudimentary transverse process and is far more medial. So if you scan downwards from 10, just longitudinal, you will hit the rib and not the transverse process. And for paravertebral, from osseous side, it's important to see that in the upper part, the ribs are strictly in front of a transverse process. And the more caudal you go, the more will the ribs show up higher to the transverse process shape. That means sometimes, as indicated here with my exclamation mark, you have almost zero uh, chance to go strictly paravertebral. So we have to do an alternative that means more lateral in the intercostal space. And again, this is a transition zone to the lumbar spine. Ossification of ligamentum flavum in the thoracic area is very common, not so in the lumbar spine, fortunately. And something also important to mention, if you see TH12, it almost has a transverse process as in the lumbar. We call it in anatomy, we call it, to good reasons, coastal process, because it's a material coming from embryology that means it's rib material. And if you scan TH10 and 11, pictures dramatically change from one vertebra to the other. This is 10. Everything is known, spinous process, transverse processes, like wings to the lateral sides. But if you scan TH11, for example, Transverse process is so short and there's almost no lamina visible. Keep that in mind if you do your scans. And now we have to differentiate almost all of the 12 vertebrae, but I will point out the most important. These are the classical Jurassic vertebrae, five, six, and seven. And you see the shape of the vertebral canal and boundaries dramatically changes down to TH12. And I will magnify that in a minute. Before we do that, See the orientation of the transverse process of TH1. That's almost pointing strictly lateral. And in 12, it's pointing posterior. And if you think that, for example, TH7 has a, has a short spinous process, that's the view from above. If you have the same view from lateral, you see it's the longest of all spinous processes, but strictly pointing downward. What do I mean with this exclamation mark? The superior vertebral incisure, the mid thoracic spine, especially five, six, seven, and eight, there's almost no superior incisure, contrary to the deep and really um, exenuated um, inferior vertebral incisure. And this is a good example where you see how, how close TH12 is as far as osseous anatomy is concerned to L1. The only big difference is the long as you call it transverse, I call it coastal process. And that's just a rudimentary here, but the bodies and especially the vertebral canal is almost resembling one and the other. Ligamentous, we have more than in the lumbar spine, supraspinous, interspinous, and of course, ligament and flavum. Then I made a gap because there's also intertransverse for approach to the paravertebral and the so-called superior coastal transverse ligament, which is the key for entering uh, the paravertebral space, the true paravertebral space. As far as the supraspinous ligaments are concerned, let me point out, as I did in the lumbar, that's always attachment to muscles also from the erector spiny and the thoracal lumbar fascia. The difference is the thoracal lumbar fascia in the thoracic area is not as tight and not as collagenous as in the lumbar. And if you see the interspinous ligaments, it's not as strong as in the lumbar, but very similar to the lumbar. It reaches the ligamentum flavum. That means it closes the gap that is sometimes present. And 
a, remember, a remembrance on what I said on the lumbar. Keep in mind that the ligamentum flavum comes from the upper rim of a lower lamina and goes to the inner side of the next higher lamina. And this is all true to the different shapes of the aforementioned incisor. That means this incisor between articular processes. And in the uppermost, it's like this with the ligamentum flavum. And in the lowermost, it's like the one right bottom. A beautiful image of a cross sec of a longitudinal section where you see the ligamentum flavum. And this is the lamina of TH12. This is L1. It goes to the inner side. And in the lowermost part of the thoracic spine, ligament, the interspinous ligament is as strong as are they in the lower parts of uh, the spine. Again, as I said, in the lumbar, there are gaps that's considerably different in different individuals. But in the thoracic spine, you have considerable gaps between the two ligamentum flavum of each side. And sometimes they're really, really big as seen here. And this is something you should keep in mind. And now I give you a mid thoracic cross section according to path of needle. That means if you come in a steep angle from caudal to cranial, for example, look at the thickness of the ligamentum flavum. It's just because the way is longer and you go from inferior to superior. And here is a beautiful gap scene as well. There's also some ligament that's almost forgotten. That's the intertransverse ligament. It combines the outermost part of the transverse process between two vertebrae. And again, this intertransverse ligament is combined to muscles, origins of muscles. In this case, it's a, one of the levator costarum muscles. And if you see opening of the uh, inter um, Coastal space, you see the internal intercoastal membrane and the key ligament for paravertebral approach is nothing else as the medial continuation of that membrane. Don't mix the one with the other. If you see the ligament, you're intertransverse. If you see the membrane, you're intercoastal. And this is the upper rim of a rib. And you clearly see it comes from rib to transverse process. That's why its name is given, coastal transverse ligament. But superior coastal transverse ligament. For the sake of completeness, there's also a lateral coastal transverse ligament. That's not so important for entering the space paravertebral, but it's very important for pain medicine. You can easily access this uh, ligament and the underlying articulation. If you do a longitudinal uh, scan, consider the orientation of the superior coastal transverse ligament because the posterior surface always looks also medially. That means if you do a scan, don't do it just sagittal. You have to point your transducer outwards to get a beautiful image like this. By the way, if you don't do that, otherwise you will not have an image, a clear image of the pleura. And you can do it alternatively in transverse scans. The only drawback is that the visualization of the ligament itself is not as good as in a longitudinal, but that's the advantage. Visualization of the pleura will be better if you do a transverse scan, especially if you use curvilinear probes, for example. Now we go to epidural. You see, by example of TH1, you see the difference between posterior and anterior epidural space. Don't forget, you always have a, a ligament that guides you, and this is the ligament, some flavor, now always um, pointed out in light yellow and there is also considerable veins and some of those veins are really really big here in the so-called intervertebral frame and i prefer to call that space intervertebral canal because it's not just an opening it's a canal if you go lower example t34 you see the difference in the epidural space and um, as mentioned uh, in the lumbar spine the distribution of fat is so different. It's not uniformly distributed through the epidural space. And now look at the ligamentum flavum. It got thicker the more caudal you go. And something to mention is the venous plexus. This is a beautiful example. And let me point out that especially during pregnancy, this may be very prominent, and especially in the posterior part. Again, you see the ligamentum flavum. And may I... Um, remind you of the fact that the ligamentum flavum, contrary to what people think, 
goes widely lateral. And that thus is also one of the borders of the intervertebral foramen, or as I call it, intervertebral canal. It's not only in the epidural um, space. TH11, 12, completely different again. You see the ligamentum flavum orientation is completely different to the upper part, but you beautifully see the posterior and the anterior epidural space. Compared to lumbar, that's what we have seen in the last session, webinar one. You see, there's almost no anterior, but there's a little bit of posterior epidural space. And you see parts of the cauda equina. Again, the ligament, ligamentum flavum, reaching far laterally, right posterior to a um, dorsal root ganglion. I mentioned that in the, in the last lecture, I do it again. The architecture of collagen fibers in the dura is more complicated than you possibly think. And even near the midline, it's not just longitudinal, it's also transverse, it's also oblique. That gives you a network of collagen fibers. And that, this was um, uh, described as early as in 1921 by Titus von Lanz. Very good work. The dural sac and cuffs, you know, there are cuffs reaching sometimes far laterally. And what is the difference, sorry, um, between upper, middle, and lower? This is number one. It's a little bit ascending in the middle part. It's almost transverse. And in the lower, for example, this is um, level nine. They do what the lumbar is going to do. That means they are steeply directed downwards. And now we go intrathecal. We have seen that. And now it's in the thoracic spine. A prominent thing is the lig uh, ligamentum denticulatum, the denticulate ligament reaching from the here, Martin, to the arachnoid and dura. And you see a lot of nerve fibers beginning of cord equina. And keep in mind, you see that beautifully attached to the dura, and it gives you a soul like appearance if you combine this together. And as I said, in the lumbar spine, every little root that makes out the dorsal and the ventral root and then the spinal nerve has its own vascularity. It's not only the longitudinal anastomosis. Every little root has its own blood supply. And this is part of the fact that intrathecally, you always have not only the denticulate ligament, you always have transverse uh, aspects. And as seen here, the posterior septum, that is continuously throughout the thoracic spine. And you see a more or less but not complete separation between left and right uh, intrathecal space. And this is another example where you see how different those septa are in the, epi in the uh, um, intrathecal space, and they are considerably uh, prominent. By the way, in the epidural, again, you see parts of the venous stuff pointing also out through this so-called intervertebral foramen. And to end up, I do the same as I did in the lumbar spine. If you put all those together and come now from interiorly to, to exteriorly, you will see body of vertebra. You will see liga, uh, posterior longitudinal ligament, anterior epidural space, dura, intrathecal space, posterior epidural space, and ligamentum flavum again, but not throughout the whole thoracic spine. And I showed you just two more images in ultrasound to, to get that right. And why did I uh, uh, mark here T? That means thoracic. It's not always as good as lumbar, but in the uppermost and lowermost part of thoracic spine, it's very, very easy to see the whole stuff. Not always the posterior longitudinal ligament as seen in this image, but the anterior dura. You see the, um, the posterior dura, epidural space, and ligamentum flavum. What's the difference to lumbar? You see that the window between lamini, TH4 and 3 in this example, is very narrow. But narrow does not mean that you don't see anything. So it's worth a try to do that. And in the lower part of the thoracic spine, for example, TH10 to 11, that's a typical step you see, TH10 lamina reaches far more posterior than TH11 does. But again, a narrow window. And in this example, you can even see the 
uh, posterior longitudinal ligament, the anterior dura, the intrathecal space, posterior dura, epidural, and ligamentum flavum. And now it gets stronger because it is almost near to the lumbar spine. What's the difference now to the lumbar spine? Clearly seen in the next image. The interlaminar window is much wider. You see beautiful stuff as mentioned, all written in, in that, in, in that uh, labeling down here. And the true difference is you see the coda equina. That means in the thoracic spine, you will have all black throughout and in the lumbar spine or the transition zone between thoracic 11, 12 and so forth downwards, you will see the corda equina, especially if you have young individuals. But remember, not all the lamina are as beautiful as seen here. So you have to get familiar with changes of the vertebral column also. And this was it. Say goodbye to everybody until questions and answers. And I hope you have learned something again. Thank you, Bernard. That was a wonderful lecture. You surely got the ball rolling. And uh, uh, what can I say? Uh, yes, it's a sad day yesterday or a couple of days ago when Charlie Watts passed away. But he brought us a lot of joy to many of the Rolling Stones fans.